Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to all of you joining wherever you are in the world. It's so good to be back with you here again. Welcome to Jewelry Industry Voices, the webinar series hosted by Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation. We look at issues of interest in the jewelry business from the perspective of industry leaders. Today, we are discussing the pearl industry and specifically the impact of online trading in the pearl supply chain, the particular challenges this brings, and also consider how the trade can best adapt to better serve the needs of the modern consumer. So welcome to this event. Um, this is the second webinar in series three, and we're live and in person here. The first, uh, the first event, we were live and in person at a trade show in Vicenza Oro, in the beautiful town of Vicenza in Northern Italy for the uh, biannual trade show there. Um, can you remember what it was like to attend trade shows and attend conferences and events with, with other people? Well, that's what we were experiencing last month, but it's great to be back with you here again on Zoom, this is our traditional platform for our monthly series of webinars. Today, we'd like to thank first up our sponsors, uh, the Pearl sponsor for series three of Jewelry Industry Voices, Paspali Pearling from Australia. So thank you very much to Pete Bracker, one of our panelists today, and also everyone at Paspali for all of your support. Paspali is renowned for supplying the rarest and most valuable Australian South Sea pearls, and is Australia's largest and oldest pearling company. It cultivates, farms, harvests, wholesales, and retails South Sea pearls, which are distributed through international auctions, private sales, and their own chain of retail stores. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Edward Johnson, I'm your co-moderator today. And I'm joined also by Steve Benson, um, who is Director of Communications for Sibjo. Steve, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ed, welcome to everybody. Um, I hope you are all coping with the new Zoom events uh, platform. It's a new experience for us as well. Um, and, uh, the kinks that I know that there were, we will try and smooth them out as, as, as we move along. Um, just a few uh, technical words. Um, the, the webinar itself will run about an hour. If it runs slightly longer as we normally um, experience, uh, we'll, uh, we'll try moderate that. Um, if you do want to ask questions, what we request is that you put them in the Q&A box that you'll have on your screens. And we'll try and get to um, all the questions if possible. Um, we, we normally start with, uh, with our president, uh, Gaetano Cavalieri, saying a few words. Uh, Gaetano, unfortunately, is um, not able to be with us today. There's a large uh, sustainability uh, conference uh, taking place in Rome today, and he was one of the featured speakers. We'd hope that he'd be able to um, um, uh, connect with us by... Um, via his phone from the uh, conference hall in, uh, in Rome. Unfortunately, he said that the internet connection over there is very poor. So uh, we're going to have to give him a, um, a pass on this one. Um, but uh, he sends his best wishes and, um, and will clearly join with us when we get to uh, the other webinars uh, later this year. Um, Ed? Great. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Um, if I can ask all the panelists, please feel free to turn your um, videos and your audio on. And let's get to introducing um, each of our great panelists today. Um, in this wonderful new Zoom events platform, you have all their um, bios in the Zoom events uh, um, uh, lobby that you may have experienced before you came in and also would have received that in the email that we send out. So we're able to save time on introducing them all with their biographies, but I'd like to say um, hello to each of them in turn. 
firstly to Pete Bracker, who's the executive director of Paspali Perling. Pete, thank you so much. It's the middle of the night for you. You're down there in Sydney. So thanks for joining. How are you today? Very well, thanks, Ed. Um, we're, we're used to doing this kind of thing late at night. It's the penalty we pay for living in sunny Sydney. It's not so bad. Thank you so much. Not a bad penalty when you've got the beauty of Australia on your doorstep there. So, um, and next, uh, Ken Scarrett. Ken is the president of the Sid Joe Pell Commission, but also is the managing partner, current managing partner at the ICA Gem Lab in Bangkok. It's also night time for you. Uh, you're in Thailand at home, Ken. Um, good evening to you as well and welcome. Your first time on Jewelry Industry Voices. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Edward. It's, it's um, a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I say that in trepidation because this is the first time I've ever been on a webinar. So we'll see how it goes. But um, yeah, um, in Thailand and up in our house in the mountains. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Great, Ken. Thank you so much. And thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to have you with us, as you say and for your first Zoom webinar as a panelist. We're most grateful. Um, next, Pamela Cloud, let's go across the oceans to New York. Um, Pam is, uh, is a principal of her own um, consultancy, a retail and merchandising consulting firm, and previously was a chief merchandising officer at Tiffany & Company in New York. Pam, good morning to you in New York. How's the weather over there today? Oh, everything's nice here. Um, Ed, Steve, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to join. And uh, yeah, it's a nice sunny day here in New York City. Great. Welcome and good morning. Uh, and finally, but uh, definitely not least, your Gellner is calling in. Um, you're in Germany or are you in Switzerland uh, this afternoon there, Jörg? I'm in Zurich now. I'm in Zurich. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, nice to, nice to have you with us. And thank you for joining and, and um, also a first time to join us on Jewelry Industry Voices. And you, you recently attended a trade show in Hamburg. Tell us a little bit about that briefly before we get started. How was it? Yeah, it was actually the first trade show for me um, after the whole lockdowns. And it was um, it was really nice to see all the colleagues again, you know, all the other exhibitors which you haven't seen for one and a half years but also to interact with the clients. And yeah, it was very nice. And I hope we will have much more soon. Good, and it's, it's good to take some steps to get back to some form of normal. Yes. Um, let's get started, but before I do that, please note that none of the opinions or information that is offered in this event constitutes any legal, financial or official advice. Uh, Sibjo provides a global perspective on the gem and jewellery industry, so please, for more precise information, we encourage you to play an active part in your local trade association and seek advice relevant to your location and your business. So, Trading Pearls Online. Now, as the world shifts more online for many aspects of life, the jewellery industry, for some, seems slow to adapt. But fine jewellery is a unique product. And many feel it does not lend itself well to being sold physically unseen. As our industry friend L. Hill, a jewellery consultant, often says in her social media videos, you need to see, feel and touch jewellery more than any other product to understand its true quality and value. And pearls need to be seen, felt, and touched more than any other item. Think about it. Pearls, more than any other gemstone, are often worn next to the skin. So efficient and responsible online trading is not as simple as it may be for other gemstones. Also consider one of the main drivers of an efficient online sales process is an ability to easily communicate the value factors of a product, the grade, if you like. With pearls, unlike other gems like diamonds, 
there is no unified and internationally accepted grading or communication system referring to their quality. What there is, is a number of different systems used by different producers, different dealers, and different labs that their clients need to learn and understand to be able to judge quality. And all of these have their challenges if we're talking about simply communicating quality to the end consumer who's simply wanting to buy a product that suits their budget. But as we all know in life, nothing is impossible and progress is unstoppable, especially when it comes to technology. So today we wanted to address online pearl trading. We know the pearl supply chain as all supply chains are changing, but why? Obviously the pandemic has accelerated the shift online, but let's get pearl centric with the panel here. And let's look at the fundamentals from wholesale trading all the way through to retailing. We also want to address how in the new digital environment, how can it adapt to meet the needs of the consumer? And finally, what are the consequences? The consequences to the whole supply chain from farming through to retail, and especially for the consumer. So with that, let's get started with you down in Sydney there, Pete. Um, thinking about why, how has the pandemic affected your operations? Of course, you have extensive pearl farming operations, um, which need to be looked after, even though the world stood still. How have you responded and what has worked best for you to better serve your clients? It was, it was very challenging and quite um, a little scary, to be honest, at the beginning of the, of the uh, pandemic. We, um, the market sort of seized up and it became pretty clear that our <clears throat> normal traditional distribution um, distribution methods weren't going to operate um, for quite some time. Um, we didn't know for how long. And of course, in pearl farming, pearl farming is not something you can just turn on and off. Um, it's not even something you can really reduce significantly. It's kind of all or nothing. And so we were faced at the beginning of last year with a decision to either uh, stop producing or continue producing um, and possibly face having no revenue for for the foreseeable future. So we um, immediately started developing an online, uh, an online auction portal that would allow us to continue auctions that have been for the last 30 years or longer um, being held um, quarterly every in, in Japan and Hong Kong. Um, but of course, we didn't know where, how they'd be received because usually customers are used to being able to physically inspect the goods and make a make an assessment of their quality and value, and we didn't know how how they'd be received. And it was, um, uh, but we spent a couple of months doing that, and we launched it. and um, And it was the first the first auction was, I guess, the the, the customers the customers were a little bit um, reticent to sort of dive in and 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 and. Um, and use the new system, but each one have, we've held, we've held one almost every month since, and each one has been better than the one before. And um, it's 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 proved out. It's proved to be a, um, a very good um, uh, alternative to the face to face auctions, and maybe one will continue doing. And and that, that's good to hear. I mean, of course, that's a direct result of the pandemic. Do you think you would have moved in that direction um, without the pandemic? I think inevitably we would have. Um, we have we have an online store in our retail business, and it's been growing as well. And so we know that consumers are getting more and more comfortable buying jewelry and, and more expensive products online. And of course, the rest of the industry, the diamond. I mean, diamonds have been selling online for years. Um, and so, of course, it was inevitable that pearls would move in that direction. Um, but I think it really did speed it up. I, I'm sure we wouldn't have done it. In the next few years, in the next couple of years, if not for the if not for the pandemic, yeah. Um, yeah. So it certainly it certainly um, brought it forward by some time. I, I mean, the next thing I really wanted to understand, you've kind of already answered it in that you know the process of your clients buying online from you has improved month on month as you offered it. But you know, do you think the wider trade is going to be confident? purchasing online um, 
in the, in the from the farmer to the dealer. And you know, we think that the diamond trade is getting really quite accustomed to transacting online, but it's really still quite new for the pearl industry, and it's still largely a face-to-face -face business. Do you think some this is something that will grow? and that the industry will adopt even when we can get back to traveling and going to uh, physical auctions? I think, I think we, we will go back to face-to-face. -to -face. I think face-to-face -face transactions will always form the majority of the business. Um, I think that people prefer to do that and our business is still very much based on um, relationships and, and the trust that people, and the trust, and there's also a bit of luck involved in you know, th that feeling of um, buying from the, from the from the uh, from the supplier who you have good fortune with, so I think that will continue. But I do think that it'll be it'll become a permanent fixture that there'll be um, between trade shows and between auctions there will be uh, a, a growing tendency to buy online to fill fill gaps that that uh, fill gaps that aren't that aren't met in the um, trade shows and, and auctions. So I think it'll be I think it's here to stay, and I imagine it'll grow over time. Okay. Great. Now, Jorg, if I can turn to you, because of course you're a you're a client of Passfinder. You buy you buy before in the old world, and you buy at their online auctions in the new world. Now, as a wholesaler and as a manufacturer, what have been the challenges and also the opportunities that you've experienced buying pearls online since the pandemic began? Of course, the challenge is that you don't see the goods, you can't feel them, and um, I would say the better the grading system of the producer or farmer is, the, the more confident you are to buy. But of course, if it's like a, a huge single piece, like a 20 millimeter clean pearl, you still need, and it's a high price, then you don't feel as confident as if you see it live and feel it and touch it. So um, of course, that's a challenge. I mean, the opportunity is that there are more auctions you can attend, you know, because actually most of the producers shifted to online auctions very quickly. Uh, some are better, some are worse in terms of um, how it's presented. So the challenge is also with some auctions uh, that they, for example, put the pictures on the Dropbox and in each folder. So it take, it's a lot of time consuming to go through the pearls actually much more than if you're at an auction yourself. And of course, the, the quality of the pictures or the filming, et cetera. And, and you said something interesting there that, you know, the better the, the, the grading system or the description system for the producer, the easier it is for you to, to, to buy. I mean, you know, how do you, as a, as a buyer, how do you understand and how do you learn the different systems that the different producers have? Basically, in our company, we actually always talk in the system of the producer. So if, if we have a Paspali lot, we, we talk about um, spot level uh, three plus, for example, um, luster double A. And if it's another producer, they might use B2 as a spot level. So we always talk in the grading system of the producer mm. internal. But um, of course, some grade, sometimes the grading is not that exact and that makes it difficult to buy online if, if you know that they're not that careful with the grading. Mm. And I, I guess it comes down to what Pete was saying about the, the personal trust and the relationships that exist exactly. between the buyer and the seller. Yes, definitely. Pam, let's turn to you and, you know, we're going down the supply chain here and, and we're getting closer to the, to the end consumer, which is, which is where you're touching the product. Now, do you believe that the pearl sector was in any way hamstrung at the start of COVID compared to, let's say, other products like diamonds, um, where there already, as we said, exists a universally accepted system um, that helps with accurately describing and trading goods online? And we don't have that for pearls. And was that a problem? Yeah. Um, first, hi to everyone out there. It's uh, really good to be here with you. Um, you know, I think hamstrung's maybe the wrong word. Uh, certainly, um, the pandemic accelerated the shift towards buying um, jewelry online, and pearls would have benefited from that. You see, um, you know, so much success across brands, big and small, uh, new direct-to-consumer brands. So. 
Um, I think probably what happened is, um, and I think you've talked about this in some other webinar webinars, is that uh, consumers may be um, even more confused um, than they have been in the past about um, differences between pearls and pearl quality um, and just general education about pearls and how do we better um, communicate with the end retail customer um, on, those, on those differences. Firstly, thank you for um, watching some of our other webinars. It's, it's, it's great to hear that, that you've been tuning into them. I mean, you know, the consumer is, is changing. And I think it's fair to say that the consumer is very used to buying diamond goods online um, from people they trust, but using diamond grading reports. Um, you know, is that, is that something that is lacking in the pearl retailing business because you don't have that? Um, you know, I think that the it's good for the industry to have these discussions and figure out what kind of certification, communication, and perhaps grading needs to be communicated to the end consumer. Um, you want to take them on the journey and the story of the pearl with you. Um, and how can we best do that? Part of the good news is that the diamond, the the pearl grading system in terms of communicating it to customers or um, again, a, cert a, a certification system um, is in its infancy. And so you can build it um, and tell that story um, in a new way. The diamond, the diamond grading system has been around for, uh, I don't know, 50, 70 years. Um, and in many ways it's a benefit and uh, and also has many challenges to it. So I think that um, it is necessary. I think it will help um, differentiate pearls um, across the industry and really um, better educate consumers who are actually asking for this kind of education. Yeah, okay. And, and, and I, I think that's very important to highlight what you said. You know, you, you need to take your customers on a journey and tell them the story. This is what the industry always talks about. And there's so many stories to tell about pearls and perhaps we'll touch on a few of those later on, Pam. So, um, you know, thinking now, and we talked about, you know, the history of diamond grading systems, and I'd like to turn to how the industry can best do this. And, and who can we best start if we're talking about pearl grading systems than to start with Ken Scarrett, who's been instrumental in the, uh, in the, um, the construction of a number of different pearl grading systems, firstly at GIA, but also at Danat as well. The, the um, the relatively new gemological lab in Bahrain. Ken, just to get us started on this, on the different systems and how they best work, can you give us a brief overview of the different pearl grading and classification systems available at the moment? And also touch, if you can, on why there is no one unified standard as there is in diamonds. It's uh, quite a long story you want there, but um, let's just start at the beginning. I think it's been mentioned several times right now that uh, over the last few minutes, the comparison with diamonds, um, which I think is a good comparison to make. Uh, I was talking to you a little while ago, 50 years ago, when I was in the lab in London, um, uh, the diamond grading system there was literally company by company by company in the same way as the pearl industry is today. Um, as uh, was mentioned a moment ago, go to one company and you create one sort of grading or characterization system, go to another company, maybe a little bit different. But it was the same then with diamonds um, in 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so it's already been said that very much in its infancy. We're, we, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're treading lightly um, through the process. And um, a number of different scenarios have come up. I think the GIA have got a, you know, a pretty nice system um, that their, their um, uh, pearl classification system is pretty well thought, pretty well thought through um, for the most part. Um, it, it does have a lot of the, the downsides in that it can only be applied, in my view, to certain types of pearls. Um, there are an enormous number of different types of pearls and different mollusks around the world that are not included in that, in that scenario. Um, 
the, um, uh, the, the, the system in Bahrain, for example, is designed for natural pearls, not cultured pearls. Um, and it's designed only for uh, um, pearls from the um, uh, Akoya family, um, which includes radiata in, 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 uh, in, in Bahrain. Um, and if you look at the GIA system and you look at that system, you'll see they're applied very, very differently. Why? Because with the natural pearls um, uh, of the Koya um, uh, family, uh, the, um, they are extremely rare. So this is taken into account. So something that you might say um, be critical about the shape, for example, of a cultured pearl, um, you wouldn't be so critical about the shape for a natural pearl. Mm. Um, so um, there, there are also other things, um, the differences in luster, for example. I mean, if you take um, uh, the, the wonderful um, uh, um, Australian South Sea cultured pearls, um, have a particular beautiful, strong luster, which in my view is quite different from that of an Akoya, which is quite different from many other species. So, you know, make, making a system that's all encompassing for, for pearls is, I will never, I never say anything is impossible because, you know, we live in a, in a fast moving world. But um, it is an enormous challenge to do that. Um, and as we've heard a moment ago, at the moment, um, most people buying pearls um, rely on the supplier's system, as it did with diamonds 50 years ago. Um, and my prediction is um, it's going to take considerable number of years to come out of that, that scenario. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, a diamond is a diamond is a diamond wherever it is, it is mined, but a pearl is not just a pearl. It depends on the different mollusk that it comes Absolutely. from and they all have different features is essentially the, the, the basis. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it, it's almost, and, then, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to be facetious, but it's almost like saying, um, I'm going to grade a sapphire the same as I'm going to grade an emerald. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they, in my view, you know, the, and I guess I'm just too passionate about pearls, but I mean, but every, every species produces something different. And Pete, just to bring you in, I mean, your, your grading system that you use, that Jorg is able to communicate with you on, that's based on the majority product that you sell, which is pearls from the Pictada Maxima um, mollusk, right? You have a few natural pearls, but it's generally one oyster mollusk that you're using, is it? It's predominantly um, cultured pearls. And yeah, we, we, as, as Ken said, we grade our natural pearls quite differently to the way we grade our cultured pearls. Um, that's a necessity. That's a necessity because of the volume of cultural pearls that we produce. And um, it's, um, I agree with everything that Ken said and, and, and that Pam said. I think that it is um, unlikely that we can develop a, a, a universal grading, grading system that will apply to all pearls, but perhaps there's a way that we can develop a, some, other, some other kind of, um, of assurance that both the trade and the end consumer can come to rely on that will give them confidence in in the in the product that they're buying and um when it comes to pearls i think that in fact when it comes to all gemstones i think the uh, end consumer is really uh, i mean end consumers don't really understand as gemologists do or as or as pearl traders do the differences in qualities and difference in different characteristics of of the gemstones they really do rely upon um, the the source of, of their of these products, and so I think uh, some kind of assurance, um, even if it's a different kind of assurance, whether it's um, that it was produced ethically, responsibly, uh, that it came from a particular source, I think that kind of assurance is probably more valuable today and more important today um, than 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 the specific quality that they're dealing with. Yeah, Ken, you had something to add. 
Yeah, just just one brief thing, but it, it hasn't been touched on at this point. And I, and I, and I know Pete is, is, has been quite passionate about this and is, uh, in, in, in the past, is um, uh, we haven't discussed treatments. And you know that is that has a significant impact on potential um, uh, uh, systems for grading. Uh, knowing whether a pearl has been treated or not will um, impact uh, your evaluation system. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, description and an ethical and responsible description of the product is crucial. Um, and of course, part of that is disclosure of any treatments that have that have occurred. I, I, I'd like to jump back a little bit, Ken, because, you know, what we were saying is, you know, it's difficult to find a, a unified grading system standard. Um, but there are ways that we can work to communicate about quality to the consumer within the trade. And perhaps one of them, if I can highlight, Ken, is your work that you did along with Pete and many other people on the um, recently produced first edition of Sid Joe's Guide for Classifying Natural Pearls and Cultured Pearls, which uh, has been very positively received by the trade. I'll put a link in the chat in a minute for that. Um, can you give us some of the thought processes that went into development of that document and how, when, and if the content will be expanded? Yes, sure. Thank you for the opportunity. I think I think the the guys on the Pearl Commission steering committee did a fantastic job in in, in pulling that information together. And I, I use the word information. Um, uh, you, you'll note that we don't use the term grading there at all. Rather, we're we're talking about uh, a characterization of of of, of the pearls. Um, the, the the document itself was designed. Yes, to show the differences between luster, shape, and so on of certain varieties of pearls. Um, but it also was focusing a lot on, you know, as I mentioned earlier, how many different types of pearls that we have available. And, you know, are they natural, are they cultural, uh, and so on and so forth, and the definitions that go along with that. Um, the, in this first edition, we far from covered all we want to cover. Um, um, certainly, um, what, what is there, I believe, can be used um, successfully um, by anybody that cares to, to, to read it and to be able to understand what we're talking about in terms of shape, luster, etc. cetera. Um, but we need to add more species and more um, characterization of different species. Um, and those are all in the uh, planning stage uh, right now. There is also some suggestion that, and it, it will be debated um, in the next week or two um, within the Pearl Commission on whether we need to add a section on sustainability. Um, and um, yeah, that's not for certain. I, again, I mean, within, within the Pearl Commission, we have to look at the suggestions and decide whether this is the direction that we need to go in or not. But certainly on the table and the agenda is a sustainability section for, for this uh, Pearl Guide. Right. Great. And it gives me a brief opportunity to plug the fact that um, we've had a wonderful webinar, Pete, and some others were part of that. Um, about a year ago when we talked about sustainability of cultured pearls. And it gives me the opportunity to plug the fact that all of our webinars that we do here from Subjo are uh, available on Subjo's YouTube platform. You can go back and see all the ones we've produced since uh, April of 2020. So please feel free to check that out. Um, I've put the link for the document here in the chat. So please feel free to uh, download that for future use. And I encourage you to look at it. One of the main things that I noticed when I was reading through it as a gemologist is um, that you didn't talk about nacre thickness at all in that document. Um, can you explain why that was excluded? Uh, you know, it wasn't, thank, thank you, that's a great question. It's, it's one that I, I've been asking myself for since the, the 1970s, 1980s. Um, um, the, the question of nacre thickness sort of gets mixed up with something else called nacre quality. 
Um, and herein lies is a bit of a dilemma when we're talking about adding naked thickness to a system. Um, you can get a, a very thin nacre, let's say on, on a coir culture, but that nacre is a very, very high quality. In other words, it's, that, that nacre is not going to move. It's going to be there for several generations to come. Compared to a South Sea culture pearl, it's a very thin nacre. Um, on the other hand, you, with, you can get some very thick nacre on, on some pearls where the, where the um, nacre quality is very poor and the nacre is already beginning to peel off. Mm. So um, it, 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 isn't, it, it isn't just a question of, I think, I think the general um, opinion that from within sort of my community, when we've just discussed this at length in the past, is that um, um, if we put nacre thickness as, a, as an item in, in a system, uh, people would, might look at that and be misleaded by it. Mm. Um, as I, for, for, the, for the reasons I've just mentioned, um, that, um, uh, you know, it, 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 sure, if you've got a pearl that's fantastic nacre thickness, and it's beautiful nacre quality, it's a beautiful pearl no matter what. But if that nacre is not good quality and it's cracking, it doesn't matter how thick it is. Now, if I might, having said all of that, and I, just, just so people know where this is coming from. Um, in the, I'd say the late 70s, early 80s, um, I know I was involved in a couple of um, uh, court cases in the UK um, where, um, where um, people were sold so-called cultured pearls, uh, where there's barely no nacre on it at all. Um, and what nacre was on there was peeling off. And um, this is obviously um, a very, very bad scenario uh, that should never have happened. And I know how it happened, the story behind it, but we don't need to go to it here. But that's where all this is coming from. Um, but it doesn't, it's not, uh, it doesn't materially affect what I just said in terms of my conversations with close colleagues on how we should deal with it. Yeah, and I think you said something really important there. You know, you, the, the concern was about misleading the consumer. And of course, yeah. we know that misleading a consumer can lead to um, a lack of confidence um, and a, a confused consumer. And a confused consumer is not a buying consumer. So we have to do everything we can to avoid that. Um, I'd like to turn, Pam, if we can, you know, we, we, we've talked about the fact that universal standards and grading systems may be more challenging with pearls than other products. And one of the criticisms that often lies with, especially the diamond graded system, is that some people feel it's commoditized the product. So could the pearl industry and the industry at large develop universal standards that are acceptable, but avoid commoditizing the product? Um, well, I hope so. And I think it's possible. You know, the, um, the trick in diamonds is that the quality system is very specifically linked to price. And the prices are set, um, I did this for about 25 years, in a very linear fashion across the factors. Um, and it doesn't allow for talking about, necessarily allow for talking about the beauty of the piece of jewelry and the art and the design and everything that goes into the end piece for the consumer. So of course you're talking about the stones and the pearls and the materials, but yet you have that added value of, of design and craftsmanship. And too often you find yourself um, in a discussion about the specific quality factors. So. Um, as the industry thinks about this, I would think about um, ranges um, in terms of um, how the ranges of quality link to price. Um, and again, I'm talking about the end retail consumer. I'm talking about um, adding, uh, if there's certification on sustainability, that can lead to a premium in price. Um, and also just avoiding some of those traps that I feel have been developed over time um, 
that have led to the commoditization of diamonds in some cases. I see the color diamond market struggle with it because the factors are in terms of beauty. Um, and so I think it can be done, but I think actually there's a lot to be learned by the diamond grading system. Yeah, yeah, of course we have to learn with what's gone before and modify it for the different product that we're dealing with. Jorg, you know, you're selling to the consumer with your brand, Gellner, um, with a lovely tagline, the spirit of pearls. You know, it's, 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 it's really focused on um, selling to the consumer a lot of what you do. So when you're talking to the consumer, when you're discussing with them what attracts them, do, do you think a unified pearl grading system would be beneficial for them or, or not? And, and what are your thinking and reasons? I think a, a grading system is important that they understand the, the differences between the qualities, but not so much in terms of price or um, to compare. And um, so I think it would be nice for the consumer to, to know why a round pearl is more valuable than a baroque pearl or less spots, etc. cetera. So, um, but it should be probably quite simple, the grading system, not as detailed as, as we have it in the trade. Yeah, you, you, you've developed your own grading system that you use at Gellner. I, I, I've seen you present on it at, in the old world at trade shows and conferences as well. Can, can you give us some background on the development of that for, for your brand? Well, basically we use the Paspali grading system, so we didn't develop it, but I think it's the most accurate. Uh, for example, if you uh, now the online auctions in Tahiti, they, they don't show the luster, you know, so it's really hard for us to, to buy the auction without an indication how the luster is at the moment. So, so we, we did this grading system and each necklace we sell, we actually give out a certificate with how we grade the pearls. Yeah, yeah. And the consumers respond very well to that, obviously. They do, yes. Not only that, we also tell where the pearl comes from as, as, as much as we know, or if we don't have like a mixed strand. And uh, I think that's also quite nice that they have that chain of custody that they know who is behind uh, the pearls. Not thank only you. our brand, but also the producer. Yeah, well, thank you, Jörg, especially because that's a great segue into the next area of questioning that I wanted to think about is the consequences of online trading. and. And especially thinking about Pam with you, and we touched on it already about the sustainability um, and traceability of per pearls, um, which of course we know, you know, there's a there's a, a continual rise in consumer interest in these topics, the, the traceability and, and ethical sourcing. So what do you think are the pros and cons of a certificate of origin or, or, or sustainability standard, as opposed to having a universal grading system? Uh, you know, some people are talking about the fact that, you know, talking about the grade of a, of, a, of a jewelry item is becoming less important than talking about the whole story and a transparency about where it comes from. Do you think with online trading, we could have both? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say um, in an ideal world, both would be great um, to have a grading system that people can understand when they're buying pearls and the differentiation across um, types. But I also think that traceability has become such an important and ethical sourcing has become such an important um, conversation amongst consumers and that interest is just going to continue to grow. Um, and when you look at many of the initiatives with the big brands and diamonds, they are talking more and more about traceability back to countries. Um, and hopefully that will eventually go back to the mines. We'll see if that's possible. Um, there are complex issues in pearls. I don't um, discount that, but I think consumers will um, continue to be interested in this and this will rise. I think brands are going to, um, and the big brands are going to continue to ask her and require the information, which may uh, require that the entire supply chain um, changes to conform back to this idea of traceability so that people know where their goods are coming from. It, it, that's great to hear. I mean, it kind of preempts the next question I wanted to think about, which is, you know, I, I don't want you to talk about any one brand, but generally, do you think the brands are going to adopt 
more universal standards with regard grading and also with regard value and also with regard sustainability. Do you think the big brands would adopt and, and, and welcome those sorts of standards and, and why would it benefit them? I, I mean, I think we've touched on it, but if you can elaborate a bit. You know, I would hope that both big brands and, and small brands alike would adopt. Um, you know, I think having the larger brands adopt helps carry the message for, forward and um, will educate um, more consumers than the smaller brands can. Um, but I think as it relates to some of the smaller brands and the new designers that are out there, just having better places for them to go to access information and to figure out how to source in a responsible way would be um, just terrific for them as well. Pete, you wanted to add. I, I just wanted to add that I think that it's, um, Pearls, pearls are, uh, have, a, have a special opportunity in this, in this, uh, at this time because of this sort of a growing uh, uh, demand for, um, for, for, for a good story about the, about the production of them. And the, the thing about pearls that is that, and it's a shame we haven't made more of it, is that the, the, the more you dig into pearl production, the better it looks. You know, it's all about, it, it is about protecting the environment and, coming and, and, and extracting this, this, this gem from, from a pristine habitat, as opposed to sort of more extractive, um, in, you know, extractive um, um, gemstones and, and metals that are required for the rest of the industry. And so I think it's, it's a terrific opportunity um, for the industry to get behind and start pushing it. As, as a producer, we certainly push it, but I, but I think that it's something that, that should be pushed right through the supply chain all the way to the end consumer. Mm -hmm. That is going to drive demand um no, there's no question in my mind i think it's um it's something we'll see more and more of um in in, in the next in, in the in the short term future i think everybody agrees with you on that i can see lots of nodding heads i mean you know out of if we really look at the definition of sustainability and sustainable product uh, pearl is really the only one that can shout from the rooftops about as you say the fact that the more you look after the environment in which it comes from the better quality product you get um so there are enormous benefits to, to, to preserving the environment in which you actually produce the product. Um, Jörg, I, I wanna to touch on, you know, when we're thinking about consequences of online trading, there's, there's some concern that, that online trading and grading systems um, will restrict the, the ability or the viability for pole wholesalers in the middle of the supply chain, and it, it, it might favor the bigger companies. Now, how do you see the future for Gellner? You've really changed the business from being a pole wholesaler into being a brand and selling often direct to the consumer as you were doing in Hamburg over the weekend. So do, do you think that the future is, is for, for, for pole wholesaling or for jewelry, uh, pearl jewelry branding? Well, for me, the, the brand is quite important. And um, I think the typical wholesaling of pearls will, will shrink, actually. Um, I think it's uh, important that the consumer can trust the, the brand. And, and that we work a lot on that, basically. Um, Pete said before that it's important that the consumer knows where the pearl comes from, how it's produced. And we do a lot of events and a lot of education about that. And um, yeah, so I think uh, for us, it's important, for example, to sell a strand from one producer and not have a strand which you buy um, in Japan and you don't know where the pearls come from. So I think that's quite important uh, storytelling. Yeah. Um, and getting back to online, you know, universal grading systems. Pete, from your perspective as a producer, there's, you know, there's sometimes a reluctance to adopt a kind of system like, like, like online or universal grading because it can erode profit margins and they can be squeezed. And certainly some people say that's what's happened in, in diamonds. Do you think that's a reason for why the, there isn't a unified system? I Look, I think it's, I think that's, I think the reason is more to do with uh, the reasons that Ken mentioned before, and also to do with um, the fact that um, producers all do, all the producers do their own thing. There's no unified uh, body, um, but I do think that I, I think margins are actually uh, uh, the, the 
the threat of margin squeeze is, is more likely to come from um, the accessibility through online, through, through things like online trade. Um, I do think that generally speaking, across all industries, across all products, the, the, the middleman selling agent is being squeezed. There's no doubt about it. And I think that it's important for um, pearl wholesalers to add value if they want to maintain their margins, as opposed to, as I think that adding value, doing, doing what Jorg's doing, doing what Pasparelli is doing, um, um, adding value to the product so that the, so that the commodity value isn't the first and foremost um, way that something is assessed. There has to be, there has to be a, a story behind it. There has to be a desire created based on more than just the commoditized value of, 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 a, of, a, of an object. Yeah. Or, or, or of a product. Okay, thank you. It, it, it gives me just a brief opportunity to use my favorite word, the disintermediation, which is basically the cutting out the middleman in the supply chain, disintermediation. There you go, go and check it in the dictionary. Um, Ken, turning to you, you know, this, this move towards digital marketing, how, how can systems like the Sujo Guide, uh, the classification guide and, and other classification systems how, how can it help in the, in the process of making the whole pearl supply chain more fluid and more liquid and better serving the consumer? Um, another long answer, I'm afraid. I, I, I'll try to make it reasonably short. Um, um, we've already stated that, um, uh, that every, every pearl is different. Every pearl variety is different. And we have a fairly long task ahead of us to try to bring that information together into one spot. And it's only when we've got that information together in one spot that we can actually look at it overall and see whether what you're talking about is feasible or not. Whether we'll end up with um, a jigsaw puzzle of, of information uh, where each piece is important uh, to the final picture, um, um, but, you, but the whole picture may not be as important overall. I don't know whether that makes sense. No, it makes complete sense to me. I hope it, I hope it does to those listening, and it's not a long answer at all. It's very detailed and precise, so thank you. Um, we're coming up to five minutes of the hour. We do have time for questions, but uh, please, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A section at the bottom. We'll be looking in the Q&A only to, to, to find your questions. But I'd like to just turn to each of you in turn for a quick final thought, a quick final question to each of you in turn. Um, same question to each of you. What single step can the pearl industry take to better serve designers and retailers, especially those just getting started? Perhaps, ladies first, can I start with you, Pam? Sure. Um, you know, as I said, I would think about the story that you want to tell to the consumers and bring uh, them on the journey with you and more education out there and better education, consistent information to both consumers and young jewelry designers and smaller brands will really be beneficial to the industry and to the to building even a stronger pearl market. Great message. Education always comes at the root of everything beneficial. Jörg, can I take the same question to you? Single step that the pearl industry should take to better serve the uh, consumers and retailers getting started? I think for us now, I mean, the, the producers now made uh, the online auctions and made also some wholesale platforms. So I think uh, we definitely have to do more in this direction. Uh, and otherwise, we just try to, to educate as much as possible uh, face to face, but that's difficult at the moment. So we have to do more in digitalization, basically. Thank you. Ken, same question to you, single step. I like what everyone's been talking about telling the story. I think this is so important from every aspect that we're looking at right now. Um, the pearl, the pearl industry is, has, is full of the most exciting material that you can use. Um, I've often recommended 
a, a book called The Pearl Trader by Louis Kornitzer. I don't know. I think I think Pete knows it. I don't know whether everybody else knows it. But when, when you read a book like that, you become totally and utterly passionate about the pearls. What we need to do is to push that, put that passion out. So that, you know, we're talking about designers, give them some passion, let them think about it. So passion, information, yes. Nice one, thank you, Ken, that's wonderful. Pete, turning to you for the same question, single step. Well, actually my answer would have been the same as, as the previous three, so I'll, uh, so I'll <laughs> give you my second thought, which is, um, which is I, I'd actually like to see that something like the RJC developing a, a standard for pearls as they've done for, whether it's the RJC or another third party, because at, at the moment, it's um, it's sort of down to the individual producers to um, give some kind of warranty of their of the of the provenance and the and the um, ethical production. I think it would be very helpful if there was a a, a standard um, that could be relied on by the industry, if not for grading, then at least for the um, the 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 you know giving some kind of warranty as to the source that it was ethically produced, sustainably produced, um, etc. Nice one. So four really great answers to that. Thank you. Um, I've got a comment in the chat here from Pierre Akelian, a great friend of many of us here in, in the industry. And he's um, reminded us about the fantastic courses and education courses that are available, especially that by um, Pearls as One, the Pearls as One course, which is a great place to go to get good education, um, but also develop, as Ken was talking about, a passion for Pearls. There are other courses available um, from my ex-employer, GIA, has a fantastic Pearls course as well, but we would encourage you to seek out Pearl education generally, um, and there is a lot out there and available. Um, we've got some questions in the question box here. I'm just going to go to them in no particular order. I've got one from um, M. Erham Supatra from Indonesia, which, which I quite, uh, you know, it, it touches on so many subjects we've talked about. But... He, he asks, how do you rebuild the pearls business after the impact of this pandemic? Of course, that's supposing it's collapsed, which I don't think it has. Rebuilding means it's collapsed. But uh, how, do you re, how do you build up further from the solid foundations, the pearl industry, which are already there? Pete, can I start? And do you have any comments on about that? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, it seemed to um, take care of itself. Um, we, it, it, it looked a bit scary at the beginning of last year, but actually it's stronger now. The market's stronger now than it was even six months before COVID. Um, so fortunately we, don't, fortunately, we don't have to build it or rebuild it. But I do think that um, just, just using the measures that we've been discussing, I think that there's, it's, there's, we, have a, we have a moment in time that we can really um, expand the, the, the sector within the jewelry industry. Um, the pearl sector within within the jewelry industry, and I think it's all about the storytelling and the and the provenance and the sustainability. It's a great story, and by getting it out there, I think it'll just uh, it'll it'll see the sector grow. Nice one, Pam. Can I put the same question to you, but from a retail from a consumer and a retailer perspective? How do, how do we really build up the pearl business? Um, sure. Likewise, with jewelry sales growing at, at a fast rate right now, I think it's an opportunity to build an even stronger business. Um, one with more clarity. I think when you look online um, across brands, the information is quite shallow in terms of explaining uh, the different types of pearls. So I think this discussion just leads us to um, a place where the business can be even stronger um, across the category. Thanks. We've got a couple of questions. Well, I got four pearl experts in the room. We've got a question from Judy McCormick who asks about um, recommendations for books that can tell passionate stories of the pearl. Ken, if, if I can first ask you, if you can repeat the name of the book that you talked about, um, and would, would that be your one recommendation for a, a, a book that can really develop a passion in the product? Uh, it certainly had a major impact on me when I first read it. So uh, if that's a recommendation, so be it. Um, the can author you repeat is... the name of it? Yeah, the author is Louis Kornitzer. Louis Kornitzer. 
and the book is called The Pearl Trader. And it takes his journey as a pearl trader from London, Paris, down through uh, Indonesia and so on, and down through places like Darwin and so on. It is just an amazing amount of wonderful story in there. Thank you so much. Pete, you grew up in the pearl business. What's your favorite pearl book? Honestly, it's um, it's uh, the Book of the Pearl by by um, Kunz, of course. And the, the original the original is a very expensive book. It's you know thousands of dollars, but they but there is a reprint that you'll probably be able, you can find it on um, on Abe's books. Um, and it's as much as it's uh, it predates cultured pearling. It's all about the various types of natural pearls. But it is a great. It's actually a great read. It's um, um, it's it is very informative. It's a little archaic in some in some in some in some areas, but it's a it's a great book. It's it's it's, a, it's well worth a read if you haven't already read it. I've I've read it many times and I've annotated the whole thing. I, I was just thinking I should look for it on my. It's somewhere here, but I can't find Probably it quickly one. to show it. Um, <laughs> but Jorg, you also grew up in the in the pearl business. A book recommendation from you. You know, all the information I have about pearls, I got actually from many talks to many farmers and producers, etc. So for me, that was the most important thing. And I just recommend people to try to get in touch with people who deal with pearls, touch the pearls, feel them, and, and get the passion from there. <laughs> Pam, do you have a recommendation for a book? Um, well, I'm biased here, but I always love John Loring's books, and there's a great one on Tiffany Pearls that exists, and you can still find it. Great. You, you, you can take the girl out of Tiffany, but you can't take Tiffany out of the girl. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, gents, we've gone a few minutes over. We do always try to, to get finished on the hour, um, but I think um, we've had a really interesting conversation, and I thank you so much each of you individually for your time. Um, it's, it's been really enjoyable. We've touched on so many important product, um, topics here as the pearl industry changes. I think we can see that having a universal standard and a standard grading system such as exists with other products is it, difficult for pearls. It's not to say it's impossible. It's just that there are challenges and while the consumer changes its taste and its requirements, and needs much more information about sourcing and the story and responsible and ethical production, perhaps that's a more important way for the industry to develop and use its energy to develop a communication system that really works to build the pearl supply chain. I hope you feel that that's a sort of a, an acceptable um, precy of what we talked about today. Um, is there anything else that any of you wanted to add to that? Nothing to add, but I'd just say thank you for uh, for having for having me and for having us all and for organising the uh, the chat. It was very interesting for me, and uh, I look forward to the next one. Well, thank yeah, you so much. Good to see everybody. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you so much to all of you. Um, next month, November, we will be very busy at Sibjo with the uh, annual Sibjo. Congress. It's going to be held online for the first time in the organization's history. Now, as well as the sessions for Sibjo delegates, the Sibjo members from all around the world, there will also be four open sessions which any member of the public or the trade can attend. These sessions will be on uh, sustainable development, on laboratory grown diamonds, on ethics and marketing, and also on technology. So four topics really touching on some of the most important issues that our trade, the jewelry trade, faces at the moment. So please, um, I would encourage you to bookmark firstly November the 1st to the 4th, and also the 15th to the 18th for those um, four sessions. Um, if you are on Sid Joe's mailing list, you will receive information about that. Similarly, if you are following Sibjo on social media, you will see information about those. 
Um, if you're not on Sir Joe's mailing list, we could ask why not. Um, and if you want to be added, um, Steve, if you can put up the next slide, um, please just uh, contact us um, um, either via the website or via this email. And um, you can be added to receive all the information about the upcoming Congress and all of the individual reports that are produced by the different commissions and the events that we're holding next month, November. So we'll be having four webinars next month, November. We've, Steve, we've got our work cut out for us and we're looking forward to that. Um, final thing for me is to very much thank again our uh, sponsor for today, Paspali Perling, our Pearl sponsor for the uh, jewelry industry season three. Um, but also thank our other sponsors, the Natural Diamond Council, um, Platinum Guild International, um, and also Uni Diamonds. Without them, um, this, uh, this series of webinars would not be half as interesting and half as wide ranging as they are. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, thank you to my panelists today, Pam, Jorg, Ken, and Pete. It's great to have you. Um, those of you who stayed up late can enjoy a nice relaxing evening. Um, those of you who've got up early, please, we wish you a, a great rest of your day. Um, so thank you finally to all of the attendees. We really appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, we hope you enjoy Sid Joe's Jewelry Industry Voices webinars. If you do, if you did, please tell your friends um, and come along for another series next month, as we've talked about. And um, we wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you to Steve for all the support and everything. Um, that, that Siv Joe gives to these webinars and also in absence to Gaetano Cavalieri who's down there in Rome at a conference today. Please feel free to hang out in the lobby, the new feature with Zoom events that we've been trialing for this. I hope it works for you. Um, hopefully you can network there. And finally from me, thanks to all of you and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.